But I'm excited today for what follows today. Um, because nothing makes us more happy than action. And nothing makes us more frustrated than when we do all these right steps and say the right thing and then no action is taken. Because we hear this a lot when we talk to people about coming to these things. They say, oh, I've, I've been to something like this before. I've been to a weight loss seminar. I've been to an exercise seminar. I've even been to the ones that you guys do. They're great, but I've been to it before. And we talked about this as a team yesterday. Each and every single one of us in this room that works here, we're excited to be here, not just for you guys, but for us. Why? Because just knowing something does nothing. You can have, we have every bit of information you could ever want right in the palm of your hand. You can Google anything at any time. But what makes the difference is taking the action on what you know to be true. That's what gets you results in life and in anything you want to do. So that's why I'm excited because we have such a good plan for you to take action after today. So yes, we're going to have fun. Yes, we're probably going to learn a few things. But what's most powerful about today is what's going to happen afterwards. So let's get into this. About me. I'm Dr. Callahan Maynard. All right, My brother's across the way. You'll meet Dr. Cameron Maynard. Uh, next month, I've been doing this 10 years. These talks for 10 years walking patients through health changes for 10 years. And I'm a chiropractor. You're in a chiropractic clinic, if you didn't know that. We adjust spines and we work to transform people's health. I have four kids at home. I have a wife at home. They were all born at home. Everything we do, everything we've done in our life, the animals that we're raising, the beef that we're trying to raise ourselves, the eggs that we're raising ourselves, it's all because of what we're going to talk about today. It's all because I want my kids to grow up in a way where they start to learn these things and see it in action. Because I did not grow up in a healthy family. I grew up in a very, not bad, just normal. Normal, right? You take medications when you're sick. You take something to get your fever down. You take antibiotics when you have a, an, an ear infection. You eat normal stuff. You go to Taco Bell and McDonald's after baseball practice. Just the normal stuff. Didn't know any different. But there's so much more. So what is our mission? We want to empower longer, healthier lives through chiropractic care and integration of the five essentials. And we're going to learn today uh, through both these rooms what the five essentials are. But in a nutshell, number one, mindset. Number two, your nervous system. So those two things right there, if those are one and two for a reason, right? Everything your body does, every bit of your health comes from your mind. It comes from nowhere else. It doesn't come from a vial or a potion or a lotion or a cream or a medication. It comes from your brain. You, everybody in this room, your heart's beating, your lungs are breathing, you're digesting food, you're producing hormones right now. You don't even have to think about it. All 100% control of your nervous system. So mindset, nervous system, being connected to that, that nervous system, nutrition, exercise, and detox. Those five things, these are the staples we've walked every single patient through over the past 10 years. And they cannot be ignored. Now, I'm gonna play a video of a patient who's been around almost that whole time. Been to multiple of these talks. And has put these things into action. So better than I can say some of these things, I want you guys to watch this short video um, of a patient, Mandy. Hi guys, I am here with Mandy and she has been a patient of ours for seven years and has gone through an amazing health journey. And so I want to hear a little bit from you, Mandy. Start with telling us how much weight you've lost. I lost 40 pounds. I kind of fluctuate between 38 and 40, but 40 total. So I yeah. feel pretty good about that. Good. Um, you know, being a patient of seven years, you've, you've been to the workshops, you've done the challenges, you've come in and got adjusted. Uh, tell us how that's made a difference in your journey. Did the first challenge, I think I was 38, maybe 39. And um, through tears, I told Cameron that this was the last ditch effort. Like if this didn't it, I was just gonna give up because I was working out like a dog and nothing was changing my body. Um, and I lost, so we did the 21 detox, 21 day detox challenge. And um, I think he does it every year. 
And um, my husband and I did it wholeheartedly. And he lost 20 pounds and I lost eight. And I don't know how many inches we lost, but um, it really was like an eye opener that I was really eating very terrible before that. Um, and, um, and then, so two years ago, February, we, well, in January, we did the detox challenge again. And then we did the, I don't even know what he calls it, the keto, yeah. not keto, uh, but it's kind of like keto challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's really what's worked for me. And in between that, I've done the intermittent fasting. So I started that back when I was like 39 and I've just continued it and stretched myself. I really don't eat my first meal of the day until about two o'clock, yeah. one o'clock, two o'clock. Um, and it really helped me not snack at night. Um, and, um, and then we did the keto challenge with, you know, counting the carbs and the difference between what kind of carbs there are and whether we're healthy carbs and net carbs and all those things. Um, once I figured out what I knew was healthy to eat, then it wasn't so difficult. I knew what things to eat and I knew how many carbs they were. Um, I started, it took about six months, I'll tell you before I really started to see some consistent results. Yeah. Um, and in that process, my husband passed away and um, I just really decided that I needed to be, I needed to continue. And there was no point in stopping because I'm the only living parent that my children have. So I wanted to be healthier. I don't call it a diet. I call it a healthy eating plan. Um, I, I've always had a problem with weight and then I believe our brain the way we think about things affects how we do things. And so I really wanted to just tell my brain, okay, brain, this is my healthy eating challenge and it's worth it to keep be consistent because I'm seeing the results and to continue. Um, and when I mess up or I fall off, I just get right back on. I know what's, I can, I weigh myself every week here at the same place, you know, once a week. I don't like weighing. I didn't like doing it in the beginning, you know that. Mm -hmm. um, but that that's a way to measure and kind of know how I'm doing. Um, and I think at one point, either Cameron or you asked me, well, what are you trying to get to? What's your goal? And I was like, I don't really have a number. I just want to keep being healthy. Yeah. So I'm fitting into clothes that I haven't worn since I was like 25. Yeah. So that feels good. Yeah. And, um, and being able to keep the weight off and feeling healthy and feeling good and looking good. So. Do you feel like that helps you anytime you come up? against an obstacle, you use that to propel you forward versus using it as an excuse to stop? Oh, absolutely. And I think it's a decision. Um, I decided I wanted to be healthier and I tried to get my husband to do that keto challenge with me. And he, he halfway tried for about a month and I was like, I don't want to do all your work. I'm going to do my work. You got to do your work. Yeah. And so um, it feels good to see some results and know that it works. And um, you know, you guys have lots of books and helps and you guys cheer me on. If you could go back and give yourself advice 10 years ago, what would you tell yourself? I would have told myself to come to Maynard sooner. I had been invited two years prior and I thought that chiropractors were quacks and, um, sorry, Cameron and Callahan. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I've quickly learned that they are not, they very much care about the whole self. And I think that's one of the things that spoke out to me in the beginning when we came here. And I was, you can ask them, I was very cranky and grumpy and they, we all still laugh about it today that, um, you know, they've helped me be a happier person and healed, healed my body. And I continue to come because it helps me feel better. Well, thanks, Mandy. We appreciate you. Thank you. So a couple things I want to point out about Mandy's story, because I, uh, I adjust her every single week. And I can tell you, she has had every excuse in the world to stop, to binge eat and take a break and not exercise and be depressed. Everybody goes through stuff. But to have an example like this where somebody just keeps pushing, keeps pushing. And she mentioned a few things about this challenge and that challenge. She's been in this room and this talk no less than five times. And she's gotten one of these tracker cards, which we're going to hand out. And each of you should have actually already. She's had them. And then the, the challenge ended after 21 days. And then she keeps going. She keeps going. So something we do have to do is start changing the way we think about challenges, diets, whatever it might be. 
There's no end date to this. We're gonna have fun for three weeks in this challenge together as a group to learn some things, but that doesn't mean it stops. You're not gonna reach your goals. You're not gonna be fixed. You're not gonna be health. Health is a complete journey throughout your life, and we're gonna learn some things. So let's get into this because one thing we do wanna to honor today is your time, and we have a lot to cover, especially in this room. Let's talk about fat. One thing we have to debunk is the evilness that surrounds fat. Fat in your diet, fat in your body. Most people do not think good things when they hear the word fat. <laughs> and there's good reason for that. Typically, when somebody carries a lot of extra fat on their body, that doesn't equal health. But we need to understand it a little bit better than that, just that fat's bad, fat on my body is bad, so I need to lose weight, lose fat. Because if we do that, then we just look at all fat, it's all bad, remove all fat from food. This is what we did in the 70s, right? Fat became the villain. Fat free, reduced fat, everything started pouring on the shelves. It's still there today. It's hard to find yogurt that's not 0% fat. There could be 20 of them there. There might be one that has full fat in it because people don't buy it. They're afraid of fat still today. So we need to talk about this. The purpose of fat. Fat has a very crucial role in your health. And there are different types of fat, which we'll get into, but I wanna get it into your heads that you have to have fat, especially for disease prevention, especially for diseases of the brain, like Alzheimer's and dementia. You have to have these for neurological health, for cellular health. If you start removing all cholesterol and fat and triglycerides from everything you eat, that is a recipe for disaster, a recipe for dementia, a recipe for heart disease, and we'll get into this a little bit more. So let's get into the different types of fat. So um, essential fat is that word all the way off to the left. That's the fat that is bare minimum for survival in your body. So where does that reside? It resides in your nerves. It resides in your brains. It resides in your muscles, in your bone marrow. This is just stuff that you have to have in order for brain signals to pass throughout your body, in order for your muscles to contract, in order for you to take a breath or beat your heart, you have to have that fat there. Most people are, that's not a huge concern, right? Everybody has that fat. Then we get into brown fat, white fat, and beige fat. Those are the three types of fat you can have in and around your body. Brown fat, what does everybody think of when you hear the word brown fat? Baby? That's the type of fat that babies have on them. It's a different kind of fat. Most adults have very little brown fat. Brown fat is an extremely good fat. It's extremely insulating, and it actually burns a lot of calories. So this is what's amazing. Most people don't think of fat on your body as being a part of your metabolism, as burning energy for you. Most people think of it just as storage. It's energy storage. That's what white fat is. White fat is excess energy, excess protein, excess calories, excess carbs, excess fat in the diet. gets stored away as white fat for your body to use at another time. Another purpose of white fat is to store toxins in. Your body does not like toxins and your body is very intelligent. So it will take it and put it in places that are away from your muscles, away from your heart, away from your brain, and that's in the fat that's kind of hanging around your body to keep it away from everything, to wall it off. Now, beige fat. Beige fat, I want you to think, is your friend. Beige fat is a mix of white fat and brown fat, and it consists, or it lives in this subcutaneous fat. That's the fat that's underneath your skin the fat on your belly, the fat on your arms, the fat on your neck right here, subcutaneous fat. It's, it, it's a mixture of white fat and beige fat. Beige fat is good for your health because it is extremely thermogenic. Beige fat produces heat. Beige fat burns calories. Beige fat is the type of fat you want on your body to be extremely efficient. White fat does none of those things. It's just storage. And they have found people with obesity, they are almost 100% pure white fat, zero beige fat. And I want you to remember that white and beige or yellow, think yellow. So I'm gonna show you a picture um, that's gonna really bring this to life. 
and then subcutaneous fat and visceral fat. Of subcutaneous fat, those are the two places in your body that you can have fat, visceral and subcutaneous. Who knows which one's more dangerous? Visceral. Visceral fat is the fat that is stored in and around your organs. Now it's supposed to be there. It provides lubrication and cushioning for your heart, for your lungs, for your liver, for your digestive system. But when those areas start to expand, that has a negative effect on your calorie burden, has a negative effect on your insulin sensitivity. It has a negative effect on your cholesterol. Where you store your body fat and how has a direct correlation on your metabolism, how efficient your body is at burning fat and using energy. So all fat is not created equal. So it's important to understand that with you. It's also important to understand that as we get down the line further, you'll see in what you're eating, the type of fats you're eating. Now this is out of a research article which compared white fat and the beige fat. And this is amazing. And what they have found is there's maybe very small genetic differences in somebody that might have more beige fat versus white fat, but it has mainly to do with, you see B section up there? environment and lifestyle. So this is not coming from us. This is coming from uh, peer reviewed research on how to change from having less white fat to more beige fat. Y'all will be doing a lot of this stuff. So what is this? Fasting, sleeping, exercise, cold exposure, and what you eat. That's what they have found has the biggest effect on transferring white fat over to beige fat. And when you start to do that, what's amazing, the, the, the number one thing that beige fat does that is good for you is it burns fat. Isn't that crazy? That you have fat cells in your body, that it's their job to burn fat. That's how it produces heat and insulates you. It takes fat and it burns it. A good sign that you have a low amount of beige fat is if you're cold all the time. If you, have a, if you struggle producing heat in your body, if your hands and feet are cold all the time, you're really sensitive, especially this time of year, to temperature changes, there's a good chance that you have a low amount of beige fat in your body. You want beige fat. Then the dangers of visceral fat. We talked about this a little bit. Now this is what's scary. Over 40% of Americans are obese. Not overweight, but obese. Now, this is dangerous twofold. Why? Because number one, you have to think, what do you have to do in order to be obese? A couple things. Lack of exercise, poor diet, stress, poor sleep, all of these things that equal obesity. So even if you don't even take into account that that person is now carrying around extra weight, extra visceral fat, Everything they did to get into that position has negative health effects. They haven't been exercising. They haven't been sleeping well or eating well. They've been eating a toxic diet most likely. So even if for whatever reason we lived in this perfect world where you could eat whatever you wanted to eat, exercise whenever you want to exercise or never, and you didn't get fat at all, you didn't gain any weight, there would still be almost the exact same health consequences of all of those lifestyle choices. It's not just the extra weight. It's what your body has to go through to put on that extra weight. Now, what's alarming is now one in five kids are obese. Children, one in five. Now, I don't know if you guys saw this, but this came out last month. We have some new recommendation from the American Academy of Pediatrics because they know Holy smokes, one in five kids are now obese. What are we gonna do about this? Did, did anybody read this? Does anybody know what they suggested that we must now do for adolescents to control this? I mean, what, is, what do doctors do? Drugs and surgery. So now they are recommending weight loss medications for kids and bariatric surgery for kids. Because they're saying it's not lifestyle, it's not what they're eating. We've tried to talk to patients about that for the past 50 years and it's not working. It's getting worse. So it must be genetic. 
There's nothing these individuals can do about it, so they need drugs and they need surgery. It's not really a surprise, right? Every year that passes, there's going to be more drugs, more surgery for more, a higher portion of the population. Now, what's crazy is if it's genetic, that would mean that genetics have changed over the past 100 years. Because this is a new issue. This was not an issue 100 years ago. Things have changed from 100 years ago till now. But genetics have not changed. What has changed? Lifestyle. How we move, how we think, how we eat, how we sleep. That's what we have to use to battle this. Now, this is important. I know everybody in here, you represent a family. There's kids that everybody in this room has a major influence on. Maybe directly, maybe indirectly. This is not just about you. When young people see people that they look up to, making changes, doing healthy things, even without telling people what to do, you're extremely powerful. So this is what's coming down the pipe. This is what parents are going to be told. This is what kids are going to hear from their doctor. Hey, well, I know you're 12 and this has been an issue for the past couple of years from you. I think we should start you on this new medication. This is happening now. We've got to do something about this. So I do want to empower you a little bit to think about your community, to think about your family when it comes to these types of things. It's not just about us. It's not just about me and you. Where is it coming from? Obesity is on the rise across the world, but especially in America. Why? Has anybody heard of the SAD diet? What does that stand for? Standard American diet. It's funny, right? It's sad. But the standard American diet, they, it's not a rocket scientist that's coming up with this. It's linked to pretty much every single one of our issues that we're having. Every bit of the metabolic disease that we're having, every bit of the obesity, standard American diet. So what is the standard American diet? I want you guys to think about this. It is high amounts of breads and pastas. High amounts, and, I'll, and we're going to get into this, bad fats and oils. And then remember, all fat's not bad, but there is some fat that is extremely toxic and extremely bad for you. And we love to consume it. And then very low level, excuse me, levels of activity. So we got to battle this. Now you may have heard this, but I have a slow metabolism. This is kind of that same genetic argument. You know, my mom was overweight, my dad was overweight, my grandparents were overweight. Um, it's genetic. And I was just born with a slow metabolism. Um, you might have a slow metabolism, but a lot of people don't even know what that means when they say it. I don't know why that's doing that. But um, we need to understand what that means, but we also have to understand that we've tested this. You see, we have a lot of very good scientists in this country that over the past 20 years have been, I mean, just scouring through genes when it comes to research because we can alter genes. We can toy with genes. We can change genes in a living person. And we can isolate genes. So if we can find out the obesity gene, then we can change that. The heart disease gene, the cancer gene. If we could isolate those genes and say, that, wow, everybody that has obesity, we're seeing this gene being represented in them. Let's change it. We change the world. And they tried to do that. But they fell short because the person who's not obese versus the person who, obese, who is obese, they have the same genes. The person who gets heart disease when they're 45, the person who never has heart disease and they're 90, they have the same genes. They couldn't isolate any smoking gun out of all the, and they, they did this across the world. It's called the Human Genome Project. Billions of dollars of research and they could not find a consistent trend when it came to the genes. There's maybe one, two percent of all diseases, all health concerns that have a strong tie to genes. There are a few things, but it is not obesity. We can't fall for that trick. So metabolism, what is metabolism? Metabolism is something that is dumbed down to uh, pretty much how well you burn fat, right? Kind of like you can eat whatever you want and you don't get fat or you eat 
something seemingly healthy for a week and you don't lose any weight, so you have a slow metabolism. It's much more than that. I want you to think of metabolism like this. Everything you breathe in, everything you drink, everything you eat, what your body does with all of that, turning it into your living flesh, keeping you alive, getting it into your blood, producing hormones, allowing your immune system to work, that's metabolism. Giving you energy. How do we, from the time we're born until the time we go into the grave, keep ticking? Right? We eat stuff, breathe stuff, drink stuff, and then our body takes that and it keeps us alive. That's metabolism. Now, if your body's not doing that very well, that's a poor metabolism. And there's some things, that's what this challenge is going to be about, is starting to transform for me from where you're at as far as metabolism goes to being better at that from taking food and being efficient at turning it into energy, from taking the fat that's on your body and metabolizing it into energy. We want to boost metabolism. We want a healthy metabolism because when your metabolism is unhealthy, think of everything I mentioned that your metabolism does, right? That's where the issues start. You have immune disorders. You have digestive system disorders. You have endocrine system disorders. BMR, basal metabolic rate. This is a more uh, accurate term. Like if somebody said, I have a slow metabolism, that really means I have a low BMR, which is how much your body burns, fuel it burns while you're doing nothing, just to stay alive. Like if you just laid in bed all day and didn't move, that's your BMR for the whole day. How many... You, What's crazy is that 70% of all the energy you will use in your day is just staying alive. The other 30% is moving and thinking and, and contracting your muscles and because the unconscious stuff is much harder for you to do. Like you're not thinking about your heart beating right now. You're not thinking about digesting food. You're not thinking about producing hormones. Your body's doing it on autopilot and it's requiring your metabolism to do that. And if you have issues, with those seemingly normal things, those normal functions of the body, that's a metabolic disorder. Metabolic diseases. This has been, for the past 20 years, the fastest growing area of diseases in our country. This is asthma and allergies and, and obesity, which then everything that's tied to that, and then you have autoimmune disorders. Everybody's heard of autoimmune disorders, right? That's a fairly new thing. They weren't talking about autoimmune disorders in the 20s. There was maybe one. Now it's everything. It's this disease and that disease and this condition and that condition because of our metabolic disorders that we have. What affects it? What can change it? Now I want you to look at these things. Age and genetics. We can't change those. We can change genetics a little bit, but that's not really what we're going to be focusing on. We're going to be focusing on these bottom three. Three out of five ain't bad when it comes to being able to control your destiny as far as your metabolism goes. And if you are, let's say, up there in age, you better make sure that these things are in check. It gets easier to have a bad metabolism the older you get, so to speak. It's easier to get away with bad things when you're young when it comes to your metabolism. That's why some people think, well, I just have a slow metabolism. It's like, well, no, you just kept doing the same poor thing and now you're just getting older and it's getting harder to lose weight. It's getting harder to stay healthy. Body composition and metabolism. So more muscle is better because it increases your BMR, that basal metabolic rate. The more muscle you have, and then especially when you're moving, you burn more calories, and then better fat on your body. Two key contributors to what your metabolism, what your metabolism is gonna be like. The more beige fat you have, the better metabolism you have. The less white fat you have, the better metabolism you have. So, so we want to boost the fat loss of the white fat, increase beige fat if possible, and let's look at how we're gonna do this. 
Off there to the left, that's clean, whole food nutrition. This is going to be the nutrition staple of the challenge. And even if I don't say anything else about what we're gonna eat during this challenge, that's it in a nutshell. You may think, well, okay, I've seen that on signs. There's even some grocery stores that sound like that. Pretty easy. That's not easy. What does whole food mean? Typically, it means single ingredient, right? So think of all the things that you look on the label and there's three, four, five, 10, 20 different things. Those are going to be off limits. Now, why? Why is that important when we're talking about metabolism? Think of what metabolism is. It's taking what you eat, turning it into energy. If your body has to sort through 50 different things in a cracker that you eat in order to figure out, oh, well, that's junk, that's toxin, we can probably use that. Think of how much more energy that takes. Think of how inefficient of a process that is for your body versus you take a Granny Smith apple. Your body knows what to do with that really efficiently. It doesn't have to spend unused time and energy and it's less stress on the body. That's why quality is definitely, when it comes to what you're eating, is more important than just the quantity. It used to be just calories in and calories out, right? Not the case, not the case whatsoever. People have proved that both ways, right? I eat five calories a day and I run on the treadmill for an hour and I can't lose any weight. Then you got the guy that says, I eat, you know, at the end of every day, two large pizzas and I go to the gym three times a day and I have 0% body fat, right? It's not just calories in and calories out. We have to stress less, minimize toxins. Think of where toxins go when you get a buildup of them. They go to your fat. Now, this is what is a little sinister about this. When toxins get in the fat in your body, that white fat, your body wants them to stay there. Keep them safe. Keep you safe. Keep them separated from you. So it makes you resistant to burning that fat. Everybody's heard of weight loss resistance, right? This is one of the main causes of weight loss resistance is toxicity. And to stay in that bad cycle of weight loss toxicity, an easy way to do that is keep the toxins coming in because your body has to continually deal with those toxins, continually try and store them away. If it runs out of places to store them, it'll create more, more fat. It'll create more. So you have to stop the influx of fat if you wanna start burning that toxic fat. Moving your body, spinal alignment. Um, And Dr. Cameron's gonna really talk about this one, um, but we don't wanna ignore any of this. Let's talk about this clean, whole food nutrition. We're gonna, everybody in here should have uh, some nutrition sheets, one's advanced plan, one's core plan. But even if you're like, I have no idea, I've never done a nutrition thing, I just have eaten the same way my whole life, a simple thing to look at is, let's stick to just whole foods. Doesn't matter if it's vegetable, doesn't matter if it's fruit, Doesn't matter if it's beef, chicken, eggs, whole foods, nuts, seeds. You guys see kind of the theme there? Typically, whole foods are things that exist in their natural form. Like if you were to pick it off a tree or harvest it off an animal or go grab it out of the ground, that's the form you want to eat it in. Now, once humans take those things and then they grind it and they add stuff to it and they add chemicals, they pulverize it, they heat it, they do all these things to it. Now we're getting away from that whole food and your body is having to struggle more to process it. And typically it's less nutrient dense as well. Less work, more benefit, right? So we're more efficient. Metabolism's all about efficiency. Fat, let's talk about the fat that we're gonna eat. I have a beef with this conversation because, and I think this has changed over the past 10 years, honestly, there are more and more people that are open to consuming high levels of fat in their diet. And you should be. High levels of good fat, it's a superfood. Everybody sees, you know, there's commercials on TV and on Instagram about all this new supplement and that new supplement. Healthy fat is about the best thing you can consume. It's the best source of immediate energy. 
There's, it's the easiest thing for your body to take in and use as fuel if it's in its proper form. There's inflammatory fats and anti-inflammatory fats. This is what's so crazy about fats. Sometimes fats can be the sole cause of pain and inflammation and heart disease. But on the flip side of that coin, proper fats, they battle inflammation and pain. That's why it's important to get this one right. When it comes to meats, proteins, and fats, it's important to have your ducks in a row there. It really is because the shift is so huge when you go from unhealthy to healthy in those categories. This is the whole, and more research is coming out about this right now. Um, the most common form of damaging inflammatory fats in your diet right now, it's the same for every single per person in the room, is seed oils. So what are some seed oils? Holler them out. Sunflower, Sunflower oil? Mm -hmm. Canola? Mm -hmm. Vegetable oil? Corn oil? Mm -hmm. Sunflower, safflower? There's, there's a lot in the, now, now here's what's bad about them. They're in everything. Everything. Anything that's in a box, it's in there. Soybean, that's the worst. They're, they even, if you buy them on a shelf by themselves, what sticker is on the outside of all of those oils? Who are they endorsed by? American Heart Association. It's crazy, right? Because that, this goes way back to the 70s when we thought that solid fat was bad for us. Liquid fat was good for us because liquid fat doesn't clog us up, right? Almost like we were a car, like we're that simple. No, not so whatsoever. These are highly processed oils, highly toxic oils, highly removed from where they are in nature. Typically, you don't even want to eat the things that they came from let alone the end product of this like concentrated juice from corn. It's nasty stuff, but it's in everything. If you eat out, it's in everything you eat. This causes inflammation. This causes toxicity. Everything that leads to weight gain, it's part of it. And the number one thing it can lead to is pain, pain and disease. And this will be hard in the challenge. But if you go where you're just eating whole things, you can remove a lot of this. So let's say you have a salad, right? All right, perfect. I'm having a salad. I got green leafy vegetables. I got some tomatoes. I got some cucumbers. I got some carrots. Um, what comes next? Dressing. Dressing, right? What are you going to put on? <laughs> Ranch, right? Ranch is good. A thousand island. Oh, man, there's some good dressings out there, right? all bad oils. Now, Dr. Ben is going to take you guys to the grocery store next week if you're doing the challenge. And he might be able to find you one or two dressings in the whole, whole foods that is not laden with these bad seed oils. Something simple that I do. Now, olive oil is acceptable if you don't heat it. Um, something I do is olive oil and hot sauce. It's really good, actually, on salad. Or olive oil and vinegar. You can do that as well. Simple, right? Whole foods. You just, I'm putting this on and this on, you know, cayenne and vinegar and oil from olives. Simple, but it's hard. It's hard because it's so simple. We're so used to multi-ingredient foods. And you know what's amazing about so uh, all these bad oils, canola, corn, soybean, they taste so good in your mouth. They just do. They make things go down easy. You fry something in canola oil, I mean, woo, I mean, it's just like, it's finger licking good. It is. But it's, it, it's what we're used to. They are shelf stable. They can handle high heat. They're cheap to produce. They're, they're in everything. They're like a preservative. It's never going to go bad. So we've got to, this is something that I really urge you guys. Now, You'll, we'll get to it when we talk about the challenge, but you're going to have a, a prep week leading into the challenge. And one of the things I will urge you to do is go through your house in that first week. Get these oils out if you actually have bottles of these oils. And then get rid of anything that has these oils in it. 
Donate it if you, you know, if it's not open, share it with the neighbor, whatever, if you don't like the neighbor. Um, <laughs> but, or, or just put them in the trash is really a, a safe place for it. Um, but I mean, this is serious stuff, guys. Everything we're talking about, this is like the knife in the side. If you're trying to do good things with your health, you're trying to feel better, you're trying to lose weight, you're trying to prevent disease or fight off disease or reverse disease, this is gonna take you two steps backwards which is just frustrating because this stuff is in health foods. It's in stuff that a lot of people are eating that they think is extremely healthy for them. It's not just the amount of fat in there, saturated, unsaturated, polyunsaturated. It's where is it coming from? Dairy. Now, let's just talk about milk real quick. Um, there, there are like 101 alternatives to milk now. This is also new in the past 10 years. It used to be like, coconut oil or, or coconut milk and almond milk. And that was really it. Um, now there's like oat milk and seed milk and soy milk and this milk and blends of everything in between, right? Um, now I want you to think whole foods. So if you can get a hold of some whole milk from the dairy, there's nothing better than that. Unprocessed, unpasteurized if possible, but even just a local dairy. That would be fantastic. If not, stick to like single or two ingredient coconut or almond milk. Now, almond milks these days, a lot of times they have multiple, multiple ingredients in them. They got stabilizers and this gum and that gum and it's stuff to kind of thicken it up and make it more like milk, not necessarily healthy for you. And you don't have to drink milk either. That's also a possibility. Some of these things you guys might just say, it's just easier not to, not to do it. I just won't have a salad. <laughs> right? Or I won't have milk with something, right? Just get rid of it. Sometimes elimination is better. Okay. And then just a quick note, other dairy is, you know, so cultured dairy, cheeses, these are good. These are typically very, very few ingredients. It's probably going to be like dairy, salt, and enzymes in cheese. Raw is better. Um, and this is something, you know, you tip, especially if you're trying to lose weight, you may want to limit, but they're not off limits. You know, these are single whole foods. The importance of protein. We have harped on this since we opened our doors. Protein is crucial. And this has very little to do with like building muscle, right? Or being buff or, you know, you need to have protein if you work out. It's not what we're talking about. Fat and protein are the two staples you must have in your diet on this challenge and for the rest of your life. And those are the two things that you have to have the best sources of too. Because they are so important for your health, it makes sense that it's important for them to be in high quality. Protein helps you burn fat. It helps get that engine going. There's tons of research that if you have a good amount of protein in your daily routine, you will have an increased metabolism. You will burn fat better. So this is something that will be a part of the challenge. But then again, it's like, well, where are we getting this protein? Because just like fat, there is good protein, there is bad protein. So grain fed versus grass fed. It has never been more clear on which is better for you to consume. And I don't care who you're talking to. And I'm not talking which one you think tastes better. When it comes to beef, lamb, poultry, raised on pasture is better than raised on corn or grain. Why? It's all about the fat. Think about what we've just talked about, right? Think about how the bad fats that we eat cause inflammation in our body. They cause disease in our body. How the corn oil, the soybean oil is toxic to us. No difference for a cow. A cow was designed to eat leafy grass, leafy weeds. That's it. It's a ruminant. It's not designed to eat any seeds, not designed to eat any corn. Now they will consume it because they're just like us. It tastes good, right? And they want a lot of it. And what happens to them when they eat a lot of it? They get fat and it makes more money because it's heavier. But then we eat it. Now, what kind of fat do you think is on that grain fed, corn fed animal? What color? White. 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 You go look 
at the grocery store, I mean, it is, especially if it's a conventionally raised steak, it's going to be white as this wall, pure, clean, white. And that's what a lot of people are looking for, right? right. Take a look at this. It's a terrible picture. But on the left, you have grain fed. On the right, you have grass fed. You see the color difference there. This is yellow on the right. Why is that? More beige fat. That animal is healthier. It's not as toxic. It was moving more, exercising more. It was eating a proper diet. Just like we're trying to do to our bodies, right? It was better at the thermogenic effect of, of beige fat. It was better at handling the elements. It was happier. It wasn't sick and diseased when it was killed. What we eat, you, you know, you heard the saying, you are what you eat. This is extremely true when it comes to fats and proteins. So don't be afraid to see. Now, here's the thing, too. You might say, I, I don't like grass-fed beef. I don't like grass-fed anything. It tastes nasty. I don't like yellow fat or even a, a, a tinge of yellow. I want pure white fat. It, it may be worth it to not eat beef. It's okay. You don't have to have beef. There are other sources of protein, but grass-fed beef is one of the healthiest things you can consume. And the organs from that animal, the bone marrow from that animal is one of the healthiest things you consume for everything we're talking about, for detoxing, for metabolism, for energy, for disease prevention. It is like the super food. So this is important. Eggs. So you see things like, uh, and Dr. Ben will cover this too, free range, pasture range, cage free, cage free. What does all that mean? That really pasture raised is what you have to see. Cage free just means they're in a big room like this inside all on the ground together. Um, vegetarian fed, that's really not even what you would want. Um, chickens are omnivores. They eat bugs and insects if they're outside. So vegetarian fed, what does that mean? Corn fed. It's a corn fed chicken. But it, it, it looks good, right? Even if it's, if it's organic corn. But think of what it does to that animal, that egg. When you're eating another animal's tissues, right? Their muscle, their fat, their offspring, their egg, it needs to be right. Now, typically, this is what most people, especially right now, they're looking for the cheapest thing they can find because it's expensive. Even the cheap stuff is expensive. So I'm going to start blowing through this stuff. Is that clock right? It is 9.55. All right, here we go. We're behind. It's not calories in, not calories out. We talked about that. Quality is different. Now, you like Mandy's story, that's what's so amazing. You're going to go through these challenges. You're not going to lose all the weight you want. You're not going to feel exactly how you want. But if you keep just pumping in the quality and ignoring, okay, oh, how many calories have I had? You know, how much have I worked out? What's the in and the out? If you just keep adding in the quality, your body will get better, more efficient, healthier. It'll start to transform that beige fat. Then your body's working for you. But it takes a kickstart, and that's what we're going to do. So advanced plan, you guys have a sheet on all of this. This is what I recommend for anybody who's got some major changes to make. Major changes with your body composition. Major changes with the disease that you're trying to reverse or medications you're trying to come off of. Advanced plan is an extremely low carbohydrate diet. We've been talking about this for over 10 years. You've heard things like keto and carnivore and ketovore, all these new diets that are becoming extremely popular. It's based off of this. It's based off of low carb, healthy carbs if you do eat them, High protein, high fat. Pretty simple, right? And good choices of those. Detox and minimizing toxins. Toxicity is a part of weight loss resistance. It's a part of your health. That's why it's, it's going to be a part of the challenge. Um, and there's going to be a, there's some supplementation to help you through this process. But you need to really start looking around and thinking about this, especially if your health is not where you think it should be. Do not ignore the possibility of toxicity in your life, in your home, in your food. Food is the number one source of toxins every American has, which is why this stuff is important. Obesogens, there are endocrine disrupting toxins from plastics, from things that we're cooking our food in that, we, that are now known to cause obesity and being overweight because it screws up that metabolic process. That's why you, know, you hear like, oh, toxicity, you want to avoid toxins. 
Now we're, we're getting far enough in, the, in this, sadly, this toxic world that we're living in, we're starting to realize exactly what toxins do and which toxins do what. Um, so that's why it's important to have some type of detox program. You can check your house and everything in it and every product through ewg.org, that's the environmental working group. You can get an app on your phone, go around and scan stuff and see what's good, what's bad, what you need to throw in the trash. Cleaning stuff, self-care stuff, stuff in your pantry. I, if you haven't given this conscious thought in your home, I highly, highly recommend it. Water. Water's gonna be a part of the challenge. Now we want good, clean water. So if you're drinking water out of the tap, stop. Okay, it is extremely bad for you. I don't care where you live. You can have your water tested. You know, you can, EWG even has a, I think you can put in your zip code and it'll tell you what's going on in your water, but no human being should be drinking water out of the tap. No child should be drinking water out of the tap. You have to filter this. Um, it is not really fit for human consumption. It's clean of pathogens. You're not gonna get a you know, waterborne illness, but it is full of chemicals, heavy metals. Um, especially if you drink, and we want to drink a lot of water, right? Um, so that's part of this challenge. This is, um, there's a lot of research on water intake and weight loss. Uh, specifically, uh, lipolysis. Lipolysis is when a fat cell explodes and is consumed by your body. It's a good thing, right? That's what we want to happen. Water is really, really good at helping your body do that. If you're dehydrated, chronically dehydrated, your body struggles with lipolysis and we want lipolysis. 21 day fat loss challenge. This is what it's all about. This is what I'm excited for today. And if you guys aren't excited for this, I'm sorry, but this is the best thing that is about today. Dr. Cameron's going to be talking about mindset here when you go across the way. Um, and he's going to be talking a little bit about exercise. We have to break through these barriers, but we're gonna do it together. That's what this 21 day challenge is really about. We're gonna be doing it together as a group. Now I'm gonna walk you through what does this look like? So everybody has this card. That's your tracker card of all the things that we're gonna do. Now I'm gonna walk you through kind of those steps together. 21 days of whole foods. We talked about whole foods. If you can just stick to that, even if you're not looking at like carbs, right? Even if you're not like concerned about all the fruit you're eating, still just make sure it's whole, right? Now for 21 days, so the first week is not counted in the 21 days. So it's actually 28 days. First week is just prep. 21 days, whole foods and supplements. And we have the supplements bundled together for you in a discounted bundle today. Um, and I'll show you what those supplements are. So that's the bare minimum. It just needs to be whole food for 21 days, not easy. I've been doing this the past couple of weeks to kind of gear up for this, see if I could find any tips and tricks and, and it's, it, it's not easy. It sneaks into little areas of everything you're eating. Hard to eat out, right? Cause you're just getting like a vegetable and a protein, all right? There's no bread, there's no sauces, there, there, there's no seasoning. And even then it's like, oh, what was this cooked in, right? This is the supplement bundle. Detox, grass-fed whey protein, and metabolic burn. I'm gonna talk a little bit about these briefly. Uh, why did we choose to have these three things in this bottle for this kind of metabolic makeover? Number one, the grass-fed whey protein. We talked about this a little bit. What I love about ours and why it's hard for me to recommend anybody take any other source of protein, mainly two things. Number one, it's grass-fed. That is hard to find in a powdered protein that doesn't taste like garbage. It has good chocolate or vanilla flavoring. Now, the second thing, there's no sugar in it. Those two things combined, grass-fed, zero sugar, is tough to find. Especially, now, this is something you want to take daily, right? This increases your protein intake, easy. Vital nutrients, vital fats, vital proteins, increases your metabolism, but it needs to be a good source. That's why it's in the bundle. Then the detox system. Everybody in here is toxic, me included. And it is extremely important, I would say, two to four times a year to go through some type of detox to aid your body in getting rid of all the toxins because you can't avoid it all. It's impossible. We don't want anybody to live in a bubble or be afraid to go outside. 
but you do need to detox. What I love about our detox system, it's a two-part system. So what that means is, there is a, there's one supplement in it that helps your body pull toxins out of your fat tissues, out of the food you're eating, out of the air and the water that you're taking in. It helps pull those toxins out. Now that's just half the equation, right? So it, it extracts it from your body, but then it has to get out of your body, right? Well, that's what the second part of the cell, of the body detox is. It actually binds, it's a charcoal supplement. It binds all of that stuff in your digestive system and helps you excrete it. And it's gentle. This isn't something that's gonna make you go to the bathroom, make you extremely sick or anything like that. You can take this all month long. You, we have some patients that stay on this 24 seven, 365, never stopping. It is because it's all whole food based. It's not a stimulant that's gonna try and get you to uh, go to the bathroom or excrete things unnaturally. And then lastly, metabolic sperm. This is kind of like the cheat code for this. This is to kind of help you get some results quickly. So this is a blend of, of vitamins, herbs, minerals, and then five different compounds that have each on their own been shown to really help with weight loss and metabolism boosting. So and it combines all five of those together in that into a daily supplement that you can take to help you through this process to get kickstarted. This is in the bundle, these three together, they're 20% off. They're, they're never discounted like that, but today they are. Okay, second part, fasting. This is part of the challenge. Does fasting make anybody scared? Be honest, yeah. yeah. There are a lot of people I talk to about fasting that have never gone longer than like six hours without a meal, their whole life. Um, and, and, and that's kind of a scary thing. Almost every single healthy culture in the world has fasting as a part of their weekly, monthly routine. When they look, when they try and figure out why are these people living so long, they look at what they're eating, they look at how they're exercising, they look at their social structure, but the one thing they all have in common is they fast, whether that's religious or whatever it might be. Fasting is important. So what we're gonna do for this, now remember in that chart, getting more, more beige fat, Fasting was one of the research proven ways to turn white fat into beige fat. 16 hour fast window and a eight hour eating window. Does that make sense to everybody? So like if you start eating at noon, when do you have to be done eating by? Eight o'clock. And you can move that however you want. You might work night shift or whatever it is. You eat from midnight to eight in the morning. Doesn't matter. Eight hour eating window, 16 hour fast. This is something that is possible for everybody. Even if you have blood sugar issues, it's better for your blood sugar. I'm going to tell you guys a quick story. This is my 94-year-old grandfather. And a couple years ago, we went down to Florida, and we were visiting with him over lunch. And we went out to eat for lunch, and he ordered soup, and he's just kind of picking at it. He's like, I'm not really hungry. He says, i got to ask you a question. He says, from the time I started working when I was like 16, when I had like a real job, I've only eaten one meal a day. He's 94 and he's eaten one meal a day for almost 80 years. He said, you know, I just noticed like I, I felt better while I was working. And, I, you know, I, I tried to eat lunch sometimes, but it just, it kind of bogged me down. It didn't sit well with me. So, and he was asking me because he thought it was like a bad thing. He felt like, oh no, I've only been eating one meal a day most of my life. And it has helped him out so much. He has like 0% body fat. He's 94 and he's able to work on his farm. He has very little, his heart is getting weak, that's about it. Fasting is a very, very normal part. Americans have created this, breakfast is the most important meal of the day thing, three meals a day, three square meals a day. That all came from people who grow corn and soybeans and cows. They want you to eat more pork, they want you to eat more steak, they want you to get fat and keep eating it so they can make more money. It's pretty simple as that. And you can eat three times in that eight hours. You can eat the same amount of calories in that eight hours. It will still have a positive effect on weight loss. Next step, hydration. On your tracker card, it will say 100 ounces a day of good clean water. A rule of thumb is kind of half your body weight in ounces. So if you weigh 200 pounds, that'd be 100 ounces. You weigh 150, that'd be 75 ounces of water each day. That's the minimum. And they have found that 
The reason why this is so important for uh, weight loss is it hydrates your cells. Cells are really what is going to drive your metabolism. That's where all that energy production, that's where your insulin sensitivity comes from, that's where detoxing comes from. All these processes in your body, they come from on a cellular level. Hydrating helps you lose weight on a cellular level and it helps you not be so hungry. So it helps on a couple, a couple different fronts. 45 minutes of exercise each day. Now, a lot of you think, oh my gosh, I haven't exercised ever in my life and I'm gonna exercise now for 45 minutes? This is anything, I don't care what it is. Walking, raking, it could be a combination of anything. It could be broken up into five minute segments all day long. It doesn't matter, we just wanna increase activity. And if, you, like, if you're active for three hours at work every day, that doesn't count. This is in addition to, right? We're trying to change things. If you don't wanna change anything, then don't do the challenge, but we wanna add in 45 minutes of anything. That's the bare minimum. And we'll show you some tips and tricks on that through the group on how to actually maybe tweak this and make it a little better if you feel like you're running into some roadblocks. Okay, adjustments in home care. Taking care of your spine. Most of you brushed your teeth this morning. I would hope so. I guarantee for very few people in this room did anything for their spine this morning. It's called hygiene, taking care of certain parts of your body that are crucial to your health. Dental hygiene, you guys have heard of that before, right? It was created by dentists because they realized if people don't take care of their teeth, they rot out. And when they come to us, they're full of cavities, they're rotting out. If we could just get people to do some stuff on their own each day, come more than once every 10 years, that would change everything. That's what we're trying to do with your spine. Take care of it daily. It's simple. So um, if you're a patient here, you know what that means. If, you, if you're not, if you're a guest and you want to do the challenge, we'll be giving you some exercises, some things you can do for your spine at home to meet this requirement. 21 days of rest. Minimum seven hours of sleep. Sleep and, and weight loss and weight gain has been studied a lot, and it's pretty clear. More than seven hours is the minimum uh, that really you, you reach a threshold where it really helps you lose weight. They, they did some research on, on a, a group where they gave them all the same exercises, all the same food, diet coaching, lifestyle coaching, therapy. The only difference in the two groups was one of the groups said they, you can't sleep over seven hours each night. The other group, they said you have to sleep over seven hours each night. And there was a 33% increase in success in the group that slept over seven hours. It's a simple trick you can do. Go to bed a little earlier and you will sleep better. And we'll be showing you how to maybe Help that out if you struggle with that. In the group, we'll be showing you some tips on that. This is what your tracker is going to look like. These are all the areas. It's a check mark on each day. It's simple. It's white and black, right? That first week, that seven days, they're gray. That's your prep week. That's when we're going to be doing the shopping tour as well. Dr. Ben, what day is that shopping tour? Monday. Monday, what time? 6.30 at Whole Foods, Whole Foods in South Tulsa, 91st in Yale. He's going to walk you through. Dr. Sarah is going to walk you through. Hold your hand. Don't get this. Get this. And you also, everybody gets 10% off that day at Whole Foods, just our patients that are there. We're also going to scan in that machine you've seen over there. You've seen some people hopping. They know what's coming. They're ready to do the challenge. They're taking their shoes off. They're getting on there and getting weighed in, because this is a weight loss challenge. We're gonna have a prize for people who lose the most percentage of their weight. Now, what's great about this machine is it will give you your BMR based off your, your, your age, your muscle mass, your fat mass, your, your water weight. It, yes, it will weigh you, but it also gives us some other good information that we can track over time and see what's happening with your body over this challenge. So we will weigh in today. We'll have a weigh in at the end as well. You can weigh in at any time during this challenge to see how you're doing on this machine. If you're here, you want to swing by the clinic. And this is the Facebook group. We're going to have a group that's totally devoted just to this. Every doctor and staff member is already on there. We're ready for you guys to join it. We'll show you how to get on that. We've got something you can scan on your phone and it takes you right to that group. You're going to be seeing videos of the doctors doing weird stuff like getting in an ice bath. Why, now, why would an ice bath be good? You guys, have probably, if you've been around on social media at all, you've seen some people hopping in cold water. Why? 
<laughs> it, 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 they're nuts, yeah. <laughs> well, I guess I'm nuts, Bob. <laughs> but it is, in the research, a way to convert that white fat to beige fat. Yeah, we want that beige fat. It's better for us. That is one of the most proven ways to convert the white fat to the beige fat. So we're going to be seeing some things like that. Um, it's at Whole Foods right down the road. The winner is getting this. Brand new Blendtec blender. This is like what they have at Tropical Smoothie. Um, this is what they have like at Starbucks. Um, this is going to go to the winner. And it's not just based off pounds, right? Because somebody who's 400 pounds is going to be easier for them to lose weight versus somebody who's 125 pounds. It's percentage of your body mass that's lost. So everybody's got a fair chance. We're also, I, t today I want to give you a few kind of tips and tricks, and there will be more coming throughout the, the 21 days on the group. This one's one of my favorites. So... Over there on the left, most people have one of those, a little space heater. And most people have this too, a sweatsuit. If you're feeling like, man, I've been doing perfect for like a week and I haven't lost a pound. And this is gonna happen for some of you, guarantee it. One of the easiest ways to break through that is to sweat. Some of you in this room haven't broken a sweat in <laughs> months or a year, especially females. F females don't sweat as much right? But it is detoxifying. It gets fluids out. It makes you more thirsty. Do you know on all the studies on drinking, what they had to do to do it? They, they had to make rats thirsty with medication just to make them drink more to see if it made them lose weight. Well, this is kind of one of the ways you can make yourself drink more is to sweat more. Find the smallest room in your house, put the space heater in there, close the door, crank it up, leave it for 30 minutes, then go in there with your sweatsuit on and walk in place jog in place. Do that for your 30, 45 minutes. You'll be soaking wet. You'll feel good. And you'll get on the scale and be like, whoa, I just lost two pounds. <laughs> it's simple. It's good. And it's really good for you, especially this time of year when we haven't been sweating near as much. This is me in the ice bath last night. I'm going to submit this video on the, <laughs> on the Facebook page because it's hilarious. I, I, I had a playlist of music going, which I recommend. But it wasn't one I created. I was just on Pandora. And it had this great song. Three minutes goes by. Then four minutes comes in and this terrible song starts. And it's saying terrible words and all this stuff. And it, it, it's pretty funny. I have to get out of the water and turn it off. But this is something that um, when you start this journey of more activity, of changing the way you eat, you may feel like garbage. To be honest with you, you may be tired. You may be sore. You may be cranky. You may be groggy. You're thinking, what am I doing? This is supposed to make me better. I feel worse. This is something that I have noticed has really lowered that in me, doing it over the past three weeks. I'm not near as sore. I'm somebody that gets really sore if I exercise, not seeing any of that. I'm not fatigued. My mood is better in making these changes. So it can just be a cold shower as well or colder than what you're used to. It depends on how cold the water is. So that water was 38 degrees last night. Uh, and it was 38 degrees outside, so it was pretty nice. Um, but anywhere from 3 to 10 minutes. Uh, but a cold shower for, for 60 seconds has still been shown to have some positive effects. Really, our, our mission here, if, we're, you know, if we put our mission on paper... We want to empower longer, healthier lives through chiropractic care and integrating the five essentials. That's why we're here and that's why we have these events. And I really want to tell you guys, it warms my heart to see so many people come out on a cold Saturday morning, you know, to learn and to take action. Now, that's our mission on paper. I, I think it's really wise if we, if me and my brother share like the story behind the mission and where this came from. So this is my uncle Dean. Dean Jacks, he's a chiropractor. Has anybody heard of Destin, Florida? Yeah. So right outside of Destin, there's a town called Niceville. So this doesn't sound like a cool place, Niceville. <laughs> and um, he was the weird guy in our family. Like his kids didn't eat fast food. Um, when we would see drug pharmaceutical commercials on the TV, he would mute the TV every time. 
Um, he worked out a lot. As the rest of my family, as we got older, we kind of got bigger. He got fitter the older he got. He just was weird. Like, we thought he was weird. Like, what, you don't eat McDonald's? Uh, his kids didn't take medications. If they had a headache, they didn't take Tylenol. They had a tummy ache, they didn't take Pepto-Bismol. Like, it was very odd to us. Now, how I, I was kind of close to him, but when I came really close with him is when I was a, a senior in college, I played college football, I injured my neck. I herniated two discs in my neck. Has anybody had a herniated disc before? Four. Four. It's not fun, is it? Yeah. It's bad. It's, you know, I don't wish it on anybody. Uh, I did physical therapy for six months, and I took a drug called Vioxx for six months. Now, you don't, this drug now you see on commercials on TV for lawyers, you don't ever want to see a drug you took with a lawyer going, did you take this? It caused over 450,000 heart attacks from, from this drug, and I took this drug for six months. Uh, it still didn't work. Uh, as we started to get scared from a herniated disc. I started to get muscle atrophy in my right arm. This arm started to get weaker and skinnier, which that is not good. So does anybody know what the next recommendation was for my sur sur surgery? And I was, I was signed up. I was ready to do it, guys. I was really seriously considering it. I was in the planning phase of putting it on my calendar. And Dean, my Uncle Dean, called me. He doesn't, we don't talk at this time like on a regular basis. He calls me and he goes, hey, um, that's his sister, my mom, Andrea. He goes, your mom told me you're thinking about a surgery. Like, Cameron, like, you need to think about doing other stuff or try something. You're only 21 years old. And I said, ah, Dean, you know, I go, Dean, like, I was like, let's leave this to professionals. You're just a chiropractor. Like, I had a surgeon tell me this. And he, then he proceeded to cuss me. I never heard, he never heard that he's a good man, you know, good family man, never heard him cuss, but he know he needed to, to wake me up. And I'm glad he did because I canceled my surgery and I moved down into his guest bedroom down to Niceville. And over eight months, um, he corrected my spine. I didn't have to have a neck surgery. And we got an MRI, and I no longer had herniated discs from the care my uncle delivered. And that was, that, this is why we have this clinic, and this is why I became a chiropractor because of that. But let me, the real reason, though, is I got to live with this man. I got to live and saw how he led his family and how he did things differently, kind of how I was raised. And that's what changed me. It just, they lived a different lifestyle. And what I learned was a couple things. Number one, health is really simple. We make it way more complex than it needs to be. It is so simple. And number two, it's just about being consistent and knowing the right things to do and staying with it and being consistent. I saw it firsthand with his family. Like his kids all had their tonsils. They never went to the doctor. Everybody was always healthy and happy. And it just was an eye-opening experience for me. Now, the big thing that I saw that was different about Dean is he had a very strong mindset. His mindset was so strong and so wired for health, and that's what we're going to dive into, okay? So we're going to start with a mindset, and this is essential number three of our five essentials. So we have a spine, nutrition, mind, exercise, and detox. Those are our five essentials. Remember, health is very simple. If you do those five things, um, you're going to be healthy. So with mindset, we want to use the best to lead us with our mindset. Does anybody know who this guy is? I saw his documentary on Netflix. Yes. Phil Stutz. Uh, guys, if you guys have Netflix, I would highly recommend you watch his documentary. It's called S-T-U-T-Z. Uh, Mika, did you enjoy it? So, so you just have a really good memory. That's, that's, so Phil Stutz, uh, he's the best psychiatrist in the world, best way of putting it. Uh, his patients are billionaires. That's who billionaires go for their mental health. Hollywood actors. Um, he's just, he's amazing. And what I love about him, he does nothing he learned in psychiatry school. He's very against like giving medications. He's, he's found a better way. And he wrote a book called The Tools. The tools, I gave my copy away to a young man in the last group that had all my, but it's such a powerful book. I highly recommend it. If you have a brain, you should read the tools. You should watch the documentary. And I'm going to teach you guys some very strong concepts from his work that I think are going to be helpful for us to talk about mindset. And it's going to help us through this challenge. So the first thing that Stutz talks about is when you have a problem, 
or you want to make a change, he says, you know, you draw a line. Above the line is thinking, and below the line is action, okay? So if you have something you want to change or an issue, what do you think this is good for above the line? So in Stutz's mind, and I, it's good for nothing. <laughs> okay? Now, I'm a planner. I'm a thinker. And this broke me. It's good for nothing. This is everything. Just get to work. Get doing actions. Even if you don't have the right plan or you don't, just start taking action, doing something. And the reason why this is important, and this is your first blank on your sheet, action is the only thing that breeds wisdom. Action is the only thing that breeds wisdom. So I don't want you guys to intellectually understand health. I want you all, my goal would be here is you for to be wise with health, really wise with health. That is the goal. And that means taking more action. Now his, we got to have a little bit of reality check. And I love how he says what disappointment is. And we were lucky enough here in this clinic that we sit down with around you know, 50 to 100 new patients a month. And that's, we get to meet that amount of people and they tell us about our problems. And a lot of times they're disappointed. And I'm looking at some of you like, I'm disappointed with how I feel, right? Like I don't like how things are. I'm disappointed with my health. Disappointment comes from, this is the, your second line, is the gap between your expectations and reality. That is disappointment. So if you're disappointed with any part of your health, or how your health is going, you have two options. You can either change your expectations, which you guys all know these people. They're the ones that go, I'm just gonna be sick. There's people, I, I, like, I guess I'm just sick now, okay? They really get their identity and their illness because if they don't, they're gonna be disappointed a lot, right? Like that's not, so they just change your expectations. My goal for you guys would be to not go down that route. Don't change your expectations. Let's change our reality. So let's change our reality. And changing our reality takes work. Now, when it comes to reality, this is the next blank. Stutz says there's three things that are always part of and make up our reality. These are the constants in life. You cannot avoid these. We will all have pain in our lives. We will all have uncertainty in our lives and we will all have constant work in our lives. Those are the three things. The three unavoidable realities of life are pain, uncertainty, and constant work. And where we get tripped up is where we think, oh, if I just lose the 30 pounds, now I'm on easy street, right? Now I don't have to do, is every, I can, this is, when he told me this, this, not the, I always got this, but this one hit me right between the eyes. Oh, once I get to this or I get that, then I get to take a break. And what he calls that is he calls it, we want to be absolved from the work. And it causes a lot of unnecessary pain in our lives because that's a painful process. Now, we need pain in our lives. It's called necessary pain. That's the pain of growth. That's the pain of going to the gym, the pain of having a hard conversation you've been putting off, the pain of eating the right foods, right? That's, we can all agree that's not the most comfortable thing. But to escape our comfort zone, we just want necessary pain. Let's leave out the unnecessary pain. The part of like, oh, I'll make it done. There's no such thing as easy street. We will be doing constant work for the rest of our lives. Now, one of the most maddening things about the human condition is that 100% of the time, when we're doing something that works, we will quit doing it. It's true. Now, we will, hopefully we'll start back up. But I have never had anybody start a nutrition plan and go, man, I'm doing great, and not sometimes since I've known him fall off and quit doing that thing. That's okay. Life takes constant work. We're always working at it. Now, if we're going to be having constant work, we're going to need energy. Energy is huge in this process. It's going to be big on this challenge. Everybody, I would, I would turn your paper over and, and copy down this graph. Energy comes from two sources. So we have our physical energy. Now this is, on this axis, this is time as you age. So this would be like age 90. This would be like age one. 
and then this level here, this is the amount of energy you have, okay? So at right here, we have a lot of physical energy when we're young. One, two, three, does anybody, have a, anybody know a three-year-old? I've got a two-year-old right now. Good Lord. My, pray for me, guys. Pray for me and my wife. <laughs> it's, it's bad. Um, so we get energy, and then what's the natural process with our physical energy? What eventually happens to it? It decreases. Now, when it starts to really decrease, when it shifts, that's usually around age 27. That's when we start to lose our, our young vitality. Now, if you guys, like I know a lot of patients here, very health conscious, you take better care of yourself, your exercise, um, you eat good, you can prolong this physical energy. Uh, but I want you guys to tap into a different type of energy that's much more abundant, but we're not born with it. We have to get wisdom through action to get this type of energy. This type of energy, which is here, which we, we're not born with, but as we age, it ramps up. It's called spiritual energy. Now, if some of you aren't spiritual, just bear with me. What we mean by spiritual energy is it comes from some other place other than the body. Okay, it just comes from another force. All right? But it's not coming from our youth and our vitality. A good example is everybody remember Mother Teresa, right? 80, 90 years old, working 18 hours a day, flying on planes, going and visiting multiple countries, keeping that schedule every day, that was not from her physical energy. She had an abundance of spiritual energy. And this is what we want to tap into. And what is so powerful about this is if we can get this right, this energy is near infinite. It's near infinite. So how do we raise our spiritual energy? The way you raise spiritual energy, and this is on your sheet, you raise it with discipline. Discipline is how you raise your spiritual energy. And there are three types of discipline. You can see the one, two, three underneath that. So the first type of discipline, we're going to call reactive discipline. Reactive discipline. And that's what most of us think in terms of discipline. So reactive discipline is Margaret from Human Resources at your job brings in a thing of donuts. And we all got a choice to make, right? So reactive discipline would be you say what to the donuts? No. no. So reactive discipline is simply saying no. That's not for me. Okay? Easier said than done. But if you say no to the donuts, what do you get more of? Wisdom, which leads to? Energy. You will have energy for saying no to things. Hey, what's that? <laughs> so you get about five minutes of energy, and then what happens after you eat the donut five minutes later? You drop. You have a toxic friend that wants to meet you, that drains you. What's reactive discipline? No. Because i got to keep this up. Now, there's a time and a place to reach out. But if you know what's happening and you know they're doing it out of a bad place, no, that's not for me, okay? So number one is reactive discipline. Number two is structural discipline. So who here has ever had like a really, like you organize your closet and then like cleaned your car? Who's, how do you feel afterwards? You feel what? Energized, right? Who here has had like the eight, my, my wife, like the eight Starbucks cups in the car and there's, I can't find where that smell is coming from. It's the apple underneath the car and your closet's just a mess, right? And some of you are like, no, I've had that. What, what does that drain? Drains your energy. The chaos drains your energy. So that's called structural discipline. That is what time you go to sleep, what time you wake up, how neat and tidy is your surroundings. Some of you that's important for, some of you it's not. But do you have enough structure in your life to make sure you have energy and you're not constantly putting out fires? It takes a ton of energy to put out fires, okay? So that's the second type of discipline. The third type of discipline is expansive discipline. Expansive. And you, everybody in this room right now, you guys are all doing expansive discipline because you came out here on a Saturday to learn. Expansive discipline is putting new and intriguing ideas and thoughts in your mind that expand you. And what does that give you? Energy. So you will leave today energized. I can make a change or I'm going to do something. If you would have sat at home and watched the news, what does the news do? 
scares you, drains your energy. I don't know if I've ever watched the news and go, I'm going to go take on the world today, right? That doesn't happen. But you come here and you expand or you read a good book or you read a good concept or you get in the Bible and you expand your mind and you gain spiritual energy. That is how we're going to build energy through this process. So let's get our, um, our reactive discipline in order, our structural discipline in order, or an expansive discipline in order. The best way to utilize this, guys, if you're feeling low energy, what do you think you need to do? Well, yeah, but get into the, like, where am I missing the boat on these? Does that make sense? Where am I not saying no? Where am I not structured in my life? And what am I, I need to be reading something. I need to be expanding. I need to be picking up something new or learning something new and see your energy change, okay? So where do I start though? This is a big thing we hear. Um, if you ever meet anybody, and I don't know if you guys have ever been in this phase of your life where you've ever been, uh, and I, I don't, has anybody ever been like down or depressed? Like just uh, like, I, uh, um, or have anxiety or you know not feel good about the future? Um, or anybody just been in a bad state or not know, like when we meet with people in back and we do their health history, a lot of times they'll be like, I just don't know where to start. Like my mom was diagnosed with uh, straight stage three colon cancer. I just remember this feeling like I don't know what to do. Like there's just so much to do. Like, where do you start? And this is a great place to start. If you don't know what to do or you don't know what step to take next, you can always work on your life force. So that, that's the next blank space. If you don't know what to do or what to focus on, you should start working on your life force. This is a very powerful concept. And your life force is a combination of three relationships. The very bottom of the triangle, and this is the most important in the foundation, is the relationship with your body. So what is a relationship with your body? What would that be? I think I heard it up here. Somebody mentioned it. Exercise, movement, right? Stretching, yoga, walking, hiking, right? Uh, going, getting a massage, getting an adjustment, doing something to increase the relationship with your own body, all right? That's going to increase your life force. Who here has ever gone for a run or exercise? Show of hands. How do you typically feel afterwards? Feel better. You just feel like garbage. No, you know, unless you do like I've done like a CrossFit workout where like I've thrown up and felt terrible, but that's doing too, that's too close a relationship. This we're talking about a healthy relationship with our body. You're going to increase your life force. The second relationship is a relationship with your people, your people. Um, and I want to again, I want you to think back to those times when you were depressed or down. Um, did you really want to see other people when you were in that state? No, you want to isolate, right? Um, and I want to I want to give you guys a metaphor that helped me tremendously. I want you to imagine you're in the middle of the ocean and all you can see is the horizon around you and you're in a boat. You have no cell, you have no you have no oars. You're just in a boat in the middle of the ocean. And in the horizon you see other ships that have sails that are moving away from you. Those are your relationships. And if you lose those, you lose the line to them. And those relationships are what is going to pull you through life. And when you isolate yourself from those relationships, you just get stuck there as the world just moves towards the horizon. You stay stuck while the world keeps moving. So we want to keep those relationships because that's what pulls us along in life. Now, the key to this, the relationship with your people, and this is the key, and I would write this down, is you have to initiate. You initiate the relationships that are important to you and the people that are important to you. This could be even like talking to the, the stranger at Starbucks, the, the, the barista. Who struck up a conversation with a total stranger? <laughs> uh, but so I want, I want you, how do you feel afterwards? You, f you kind of feel good, don't you, right? What's increased? Your life force has increased because now you're being pulled towards that horizon by that relationship. Isn't that so cool? The last relationship is the relationship with your self, All right? This is the most difficult for me. Some of you have a great relationship with yourself. You're fine. You're like, I don't even, I don't even like being around these people. Like I want to be home by myself. That's Dr. Ben back there. He's a, uh, <laughs> he, uh, he could just, let's just say he could just be by himself and he'd be fine. <laughs> um, 
I am a little more like I want somebody around. Like, hey, what do you want to talk about? You want to go do something? Let's go do this. Like, that's how I'm wired. Um, but I, so I have an issue with this, guys. I need to have a better relationship with myself. And how you do this is through three things. Either journaling, which is writing down something. Journaling, writing down what's in your brain. Number two is meditation. And number three is prayer. So prayer, meditation, or writing something down on a consistent basis. So who here has ever meditated or journaled or prayed? How do you feel afterwards? Feel good? So it's amazing. Like remember I said about the human condition, the things that work for us, 100% of the time, what do we stop doing? We cannot stop these things. We want to keep our relationship with our body, with our people, and with ourselves. That's how we're going to build our life force. All right? So as we move out of mindset, there's a couple... uh, road cones we have to drive around and we've got to talk about stress and I want you guys to we have to delineate what is the difference between a craving and an addiction it's an important conversation so what is when you say I crave oh I crave pasta or I'm craving a coke or I'm craving a for my mother-in-law it's a diet Dr. Pepper like What's the difference between a, an honest to God craving and a addiction or an addiction? Well, craving yeah. has that it's called over. You can say mm-hmm. no to something you want to avoid. It's a good answer. I like that. Okay. Yeah, that's a good answer. Yeah. So addiction will affect you physically. So affect you in a negative way. Right. Good. That's good. Those are those are both good answers. Okay. Um, I had a. I did a lot of research on this, and I want to give you guys my best answer that I've, I've came up with or that I've seen in the literature. A craving, and this is on your sheet, a craving is desiring a food, or you could put anything, but desiring something to address a deficiency. A deficiency. A craving is desiring a food, we're going to just keep this in the context of food, to address a deficiency. An addiction is desiring a food to trigger a endorphin release. Yeah. So let's get into this a little bit. Who here has been really thirsty before? Right. That is what we call a craving. You were deficient in water. Your body tells you, okay, you drink a bunch of water. All right. You fulfill that craving. 15 minutes later, do you want more water? No, because it's not an addiction. Who here has craved M&M's and some candy or cake, right? And you eat it, and then what happens 15 minutes later? More. That's called an addiction because it's about an endorphin release. So you're not craving, because there's no such thing as a carbohydrate deficiency. You don't need carbohydrates in your body. Just, there's, fatty, there's a fatty acid deficiency. There's amino acid or protein deficiency. There's no such thing as a carbohydrate deficiency. You can go your whole life without having one carbohydrate and you'll live a happy, healthy life. It's called being an Eskimo. You'll live a long time. Never come in contact with a carbohydrate. So carbohydrates aren't typically a craving. They're a, or an addiction because you get that endorphin release. And how you know is because after 15 minutes, you want another one because it's about to hit. Now, if we're going to get really into this, guys, this is the root of drug abuse. This is the root of alcoholism. This is the root of infidelity in marriages a lot of the times. It is about endorphin release. So when we want to be clear about this, when it comes to food, you're not having food cravings. We're having addiction issues with food. And we want to treat them as such, okay? I want to be very clear. I love chocolate chip cookies. I love brownies. I love pizza. I love those things. But it did help me to know that I'm not craving them. There's an addiction that happened from childhood on that I learned and would condition to get an endorphin release to feel better. You're down, you're depressed, you're tired, you're stressed at work. I want to feel better. Let's get an endorphin release. Let's eat something. Is everybody tracking with me? Okay. So now at the root of some stress and triggers, we have cortisol, the stress hormone. And we're going to do just a real brief scientific dive into this before we move on. Now cortisol has got a bad rap. It's our stress hormone. It makes us age early. It causes diabetes, heart disease, cancer. It's basically linked to every disease that's degenerative that we know about. And it comes from chronic, chronically being overstressed. Not sleeping, drinking alcohol, drinking too much coffee. These are all things that trigger our cortisol response. But I want you guys to know there is a purpose and it is 
Like we weren't, do you guys think we were made stupidly? Does God make junk or does, no? So there's a reason we have cortisol. I'm going to talk to you about some of the good things about cortisol. So what's nuts is about 20 minutes before you wake up, which is nuts, is your body knows you're going to wake up in 20 minutes. You will release, your body will dump two hormones, one called cortisol, one called glucagon. Glucagon's the opposite of insulin. And it dumps those two hormones to squeeze your liver and make your liver release sugar into your bloodstream to give you energy because what's going to happen in 20 minutes? You're going to wake up. And if you have a healthy cortisol response, you wake up and you're ready to go because you've got sugar in your bloodstream. Is everybody with me? Amazing. It's about your cortisol is about 20 units. First thing when you open, when you wake up and you open your eyes, it's at 20 units. And then it falls throughout the day to about two units throughout the day. And that's normal. That's what we want to see. Now, the issue is, is when you wake up, you have sugar in your bloodstream. You already have all the energy you need to take on the day. And then what did most of us do? What type of breakfast would we eat initially? So, so pancakes, French toast, cereal, donuts, um, even oatmeal, orange juice. You guys, you, guys, you guys with me? So we already have sugar in our bloodstream first thing in the morning. Now we add more sugar into our bloodstream, which uh, stimulates an insulin response, and it doesn't make us feel energized. It makes us feel what? Makes us feel drained and tired. And this is why you want to take that mid-morning nap after you have that big pancake. You already have all the sugar you need in your bloodstream. So this is why part of the challenge is going to be intermittent fasting. Now I was talking with Erica here. Intermittent fasting is different. If you're female and if you have any type of thyroid or known thyroid condition, if you do, we want to fast, intermittent fast two days out of the week and then take a three-day break and then do it two days and then do take a three-day break. Is everybody with me? Now, if you're female, I would recommend you try to just fast completely. But um, if you notice that you really get weak or you get shaky or you feel something's up, go to the two-three model as a female. Is everybody with me on that? Guys, you guys are not on... You guys are fasting, all right? You got enough sugar when you wake up, okay? You all are good. Um, so that was in your notes, guys. So uh, when you wake up in the morning, your liver is squeezed by cortisol and glucagon to release sugar and give you energy. This is why you should never have sugar for breakfast. If you must eat breakfast, it should be eggs and bacon and protein. It needs to be pr pure protein and fat. Try to do no sugar if possible. I would recommend if you, know, if, if you guys are um, a couple here or you have an accountability partner or if you have a spouse here that you exercise together. Um, but it really depends on what type of goals you have for the exercise you do. If you wanna put on muscle, um, you need to be lifting weights. If you like running, you need to be running. If you just like being outside and walking or hiking, that's what we need to, need to do. If you wanna go, if you like to swim, go swim. Uh, but there is no excuse for doing nothing. All right. Now we have built you guys something that everybody will have a tool that you need no equipment. I'm real excited to share this with you. Uh, but the goal is, is that we exercise seven days a week for at least 45 minutes. That is the goal we're shooting for. That is an action we want to take. Now, um, <laughs> this is Derek. Hey, he is awesome. This is the first workout that we filmed and Who's that stud there? Um, and he's taken me through a 45 minute workout and it's amazing. And here's why I love his workouts. Derek is like, um, he, he's done what's called teacher training yoga, which he invested about $50,000 to be, a be one of the best yoga instructors on the planet. He is an expert in kettlebells and calisthenics. Um, he's just, he, he's like in his late forties. You see how young he looks? He's really fit guy. And what I love about his workouts is, I don't know if you guys have ever done a workout, like I did CrossFit and you feel kind of worse afterwards, kind of beat up, your joints hurt. His workouts, you feel better at the end of it. You feel like you actually feel good. We will be releasing one of these workouts every week of the 21 day challenge. So you'll do this workout every day for seven days. Then you have another one you do for seven days and then another one you do for seven days. And what I love there will be no equipment involved. You'll need no weights, no machines, nothing. It'll just be a water bottle and yourself, and that's it. Now, at the end of this challenge, we're gonna come here on a Saturday and we're gonna do a group workout with Derek. And then I think what we're gonna do is if, 
just volunteer basis is we're going to do ice baths to wrap up the challenge. Get in the ice. Now, does anybody know why we get in an ice bath or why to do it? We don't do it for long, just for two minutes. Because you're, <laughs> you're nuts, right? Um, you do it for a lot of reasons, but the reason I like it is it helps you with your stress response. It helps you sit through pain and go, this is terrible, but I'm just going to sit here and I'm going to take it and I have control of my body and it builds a tolerance so you can control yourself. And it's, it's, not, it's not mandatory, but we may be doing that on that Saturday. We'll get a workout in, then we'll do some ice baths, we'll have a lot of fun, and then we're going to celebrate the winner. Did Dr. Kelly tell you what you win if you win this challenge? $400 blender, guys. That's like the real deal right there. So... There is no excuse. You can see we're starting with just simple ankle mobility to reduce pain. It's gonna, these, these workouts are excellent. So there's no excuse not to follow. We're going to be dropping these um, workouts in the Facebook group, and you're going to get a link to them so you have all of these workouts. Anytime of day. Any, anytime, just get it in. Okay? Um, so we're going to create an exercise routine. You bring up a good point. It's any time of day. It's 45 minutes and it's seven days a week, try to get in, no rest days needed. Now remember, the biggest thing we hear, why, why do you think people don't exercise? What's the biggest excuse we hear? Time, it's time. And you guys remember the way to spiritual energy, discipline. One of those disciplines is structural discipline. You guys have a week to plan before the challenge. Get out your planner and go, what is the time of day we're sneaking this in? When are we getting in the 45 minutes? You could start half the video, do half of it, half the day, half the video, the uh, second half of the day, whatever it is. But we, I guarantee you there's 45 minutes somewhere in your day that you can use to exercise. All right, so let's move on and close out with our lifeline, our spine. Now, before we get into the structure of the spine, we've got to talk spinal chemistry. Uh, this is a very important conversation. So we are more and more seeing, as we x-ray people, younger and younger people with arthritis and bone spurs in their body. It's really blowing us away. And everywhere, in their spine, in their hips, in their shoulders. I, I turned 40 this year. I have a lot of friends that have bone spurs already having surgery where they're removing bone spurs. Um, that is not good. That's not good. And it, comes from a, it can come from a structural issue or an injury. But the type of arthritis we're seeing, it's coming from something different. And here's where we're seeing it come from. When you eat sugar, okay, that sugar has to go into a cell in your body, all right? The sugar goes into the cell. Now, once that cell is full of sugar, it will block and say, no more sugar can come in. So that sugar will have to hang out outside the cell in what's called the intercellular space. And when sugar hangs out outside the cell in your body, it attracts fluid, water, all right? So has anybody ever ate really bad or like a piece of cake, they kind of feel swollen, your joints hurt? That's this process. Now when the water and the sugar is hanging out outside the cell, it binds to a protein called collagen. And when it sticks, sugar sticks to collagen, it damages the collagen and causes an immune response. Your immune system recognizes the damaged collagen and it sends inflammation in calcium to that region. Is everybody with me? And that inflammation in calcium causes bone spurs and arthritis. Everybody got it? So the root, and this is on your sheet, arthritis in the joints is caused when too much sugar is ingested, causing water to pull around cells. In that fluid, sugar and collagen stick together and cause an immune response that immune response causes inflammation and calcium to migrate to the area, resulting in bone spurs and arthritis. Here's the good news. It only takes seven to 10 days to reverse the insulin resistance. So who here has come off sugar before? Show of hands. Does everyone remember the quick weight loss that happens, the immediate weight loss? Guess what you're losing? Water. water. So, so water and inflammation. So when the water goes, then the inflammation follows, and that's why you feel so much better. But when he goes, oh, I'm just losing water weight, like when he was like, oh, it's just, it's not that big a deal, it's water weight. It's a huge deal when you lose water weight. You're not having a chronic inflammation response that's happening all over your body from the water sticking, and the water and the sugar sticking to the collagen in your system. Is everybody with me? 
big change. And now what's cool is it only takes seven to 10 days. So what you guys may notice on this challenge, the first week to two weeks, you lose weight quickly. That's water. That's a good thing. That's a great thing as far as the joints are concerned. Now let's get into the structure of the spine. And I want to share, uh, I'm going to have a guy named Mario speak to you guys. Um, and Mario's an interesting case. He's doing everything right, but he's still in an immense amount of pain. He's a veteran. Uh, he, he does like stretching. He eats good. And when he met with us um, for the first time, he started, he like started crying in the room. He was like, I don't know why I hurt all the time. Um, cause he's, it's, his is not from the water weight. You guys with me, it's not from that arthritis. He's not have, he doesn't have pain because he's eating too much sugar. He's eating good, but he's still in an immense amount of pain. His pain's coming from his spine structure itself. I want you guys to hear his story and give you the kind of the full view of what's going on. Hi, my name is Mario Garcia. I'm 45 years old. Um, I've been on this journey for quite a while. Um, growing up, I had migraines my whole life. Never knew why. Um, about 18, they started to kind of go away. And throughout the years, just have had issues with my back. Um, when I was in the military, I was electrocuted and was thrown off a pole and messed up my shoulder and my hip, which I didn't figure out till about 20 years later. Fairly health conscious um, throughout the last 40, 25 years of my life. Um, I've always had issues with my hips. Um, never knew why. And so after COVID, I was bedridden for nine months and was able to um, finally get up and move around and realized that my body was out of alignment. I needed to get fixed. So I went to one chiropractor who I just was regularly, regularly going to and decided that that wasn't doing it. So in that same process, I had started going to a massage therapist um, who recommended me to Maynard Chiropractic here. And so I decided to come over here and to see what was different about all the other chiropractors that I've been to throughout my life. First thing I noticed was the waiting room and the equipment that was in the room with there. Um, they explained to me what the process was, how the process was gonna go. Um, one of the first things I noticed was they were giving us exercises to do before we got adjusted. That's one thing in my 15 years of chiropractic I've never seen in my life. Not gonna lie, it was kind of funny. When I walked in, I was like, what is this? Um, but because nothing ever worked before, I was willing to try something new. And um, that first day, they went over, they took x-rays and they went over um, my x-rays and they showed me what my neck looked like and they showed me how it's supposed to look like as well. And then that same day, they drew out a plan for me, a 16-week plan um, to help me get better. The difference about this plan was is they were giving me the tools to help myself. And I've never had a doctor that have, has given me the tools that I needed so that I can be responsible for my health. So the second that happened, I knew that I was in a different spot. I left, I think the first day with the equipment that they gave me and I started doing the exercises. I was coming three times a week. After the first month, I already had noticed a difference, a tremendous difference. I, started, I had started doing yoga a few months before um, to help with this issue and I've noticed the difference in, in yoga and my practice actually getting better as well. Different moves were easier to do, my hips were loosening up. so. It had a huge part in everything in my life. Um, I've been doing it now for three or four months. I've switched down to one time, a, one time a, a week and I feel fantastic. I've been able to do the things that I hadn't been able to do before and even do things that I've never been able to do. I actually feel better than I've ever felt in my whole life. Um, one of the things they found out that was wrong with me is I have sacral obliquity, I believe, is, or sacral morphology is another term for it. And I've been through five, six different chiropractors who've done the same x-rays and never once told me that I had this issue. Um, they were able to get my body to a point to where it was almost perfect, where literally they couldn't do anymore. And that's the reason why they were able to see what was wrong with my body. 
I could go back 20 years, I would tell myself to find the right chiropractor who will give you the tools that will give you the responsibility to take care of your health because that's the reason why I'm here today is because they gave me the opportunity. Cool story. Yes, yeah, just really cool. Um, he's just a sweet guy and um, I don't want to say we're, because he kind of, he'd seen a lot of, chiro we're like a sixth chiropractor. I don't want to say we're better than those people. It's just different here. And it's different. I want The, the biggest difference I want to talk about, um, we address subluxation and subluxation is when your spine is out of its normal position. If you want to know what subluxation feels like, walk around like this for about three hours and see how you feel afterwards. That's, this is a subluxation. My skull's not in the right position. That's not the most common thing we see with subluxation. The most common areas we see issues with subluxation is when you look at me from the side, is you need to have curves in your spine from the side. You have a curve in your neck, you have a curve in your mid-back, and you have a proper curve in your low back. Now, it's like you heard with Mario, Mario's curves were all jacked up from, he was a veteran. You guys heard that he'd been through a lot. A lot of uh, service people do go through a lot. He rocked a lot, he fell off a pole, he was electrocuted, and he had damaged those curves. And that, that causes pain and it causes degeneration and arthritis. I wanna show you this illustration because it, it causes deeper things. And you'll really be able to visualize this. So you can see the natural curve here. This is normally what we should see in the neck. And as we zoom in deeper into the neck, these are the nerves that exit the neck. These are the joints. This is the spinal cord inside the neck. When you lose that, this is what happens. And we see this all the time. We see pinching on the nerves. You can see there's bone spurring that occurs, but you see this cord. Everybody see that? This is important. So this will really drive the point home. Everybody put a curve in your hand for me. So put a curve, this is the curve in your neck. I want you to feel the palm of your hand. Feel that skin, because everybody's pretty loose. That's your spinal cord. Get electrocuted and fall off a pole and lose the curve in your neck. What happens to your spinal cord? Tightens. So this is on your sheet here. Restoring the natural spinal curves not only reduces pain and decreases arthritis, but also removes pathological tension to the spinal cord. This is very important, pathological tension. And the, the positions that you, and this is the next part, the positions that you sit in and sleep in mold and protect the curves in your spine. So it's real important to protect those curves by sitting and sleeping. Now, everybody who's a patient, you should know what these look like, right? Or trusty tools. So these are spinal molding rolls. The large one goes behind the neck. The uh, smaller one goes behind your low back. And the goal is to sleep on these on a flat surface and that will mold your curves in your spine, protect your spinal cord and nervous system, and really correct the position and the muscles and ligaments and tendons in your spine. Uh, we wanna try to make it 30 minutes if we can, but four hours is a big win. Uh, and if you're an all-star, you sleep all night on these. Now, when you first try doing this, how does this feel at first? Doesn't feel great at first because we're not in the right position, but as your body molds into the right position, I found I start to crave these. I start to want to get on these and get in this position. And this is really powerful to protect your spine. And every, every patient gets those. Uh, now, another part is you get the whole home care kit, which is like traction and wobble. We have different tools and that's what Mario brought up. He was religious with using the tools. And that's very important, things that you do at home so you get more from the adjustment. But I wanna teach everybody how to sit, okay? So we're gonna sit, this is how we should try to strive to sit. And usually, typically it's females that have the hardest time with this. So the initial part of sitting that makes it good sitting posture is that you spread your knees as wide as you can get your knees. My jeans are a little, <laughs> a little tight, but we're gonna go as wide as we can. So everybody try this with me. Go real wide. I mean, really wide, as wide as your hips will allow, and sit with a big chest. You should be sitting on the edge of the front of your chair. Yeah, okay. So forward, I'm just checking everybody here. Everybody's looking pretty good. Good job. You guys see how that feels a little different? feel different. Now, this is how we should strive to sit. You'll notice 
your, your back will be too weak to do this at first. It'll burn a little bit, but with time, this will be a comfortable sitting posture, and this will keep you from going into this posture as you age. Now, you wanna try to sit like this in the car, spread your knees, get your back flat, sit like this at home. Now, when I'm relaxing, I'm not relaxing at home watching TV like this. You know, that's just not, some of you may picture me like, this is not how I watch Netflix or, or you know, but I'm sitting at the dinner table like this. I'm sitting at my workstation like this. If I'm here at the clinic, I'm sitting like this. Um, anytime I'm sitting like this, now if I'm relaxing, I'm gonna lay down or I'm gonna build up a lot of pillows to be in a relaxed, reclined position, but this is not allowed. Where the couch kind of sucks you in and your back goes like this, that's what we're not allowed to sit like. So is everybody, with, how great does this, I mean, this feels different, right? You're protecting your spine. Now, that is what's gonna protect the curves. Now, how do we know if we have issues with the curves? We have issues with uh, the position of the spine, if there's damage to the nervous system. There's some warning signs. The biggest warning signs I wanna bring up are, are headaches. That's a big warning sign that there's damage specifically to the neck. Neck pain, mid-back pain, low back pain, numbness in the hands, uh, sciatica or pain on the legs, pain in the hips or the butt. Um, and then also we have some ones you wouldn't think of with chiropractic. Some big ones are like issues sleeping, blood pressure, and another one like constipation and chronic infections. Not a lot of people associate that with spinal issues. Do you guys remember Christopher Reeve who played Superman? Yet he died from a bed sore. So he had, your nervous system is so tied in with your immune system. That's what controls your, um, that's what controls your immune system is your nervous system. There's a lot of health experts that think the big issue with why we have cancer is because our nervous system is so ramped up from stress that it depletes our immune system and that's why we're not fighting cancer like we used to. Now, why, how did Christopher Reeves die? He had damage to his nervous system and he got a bed sore and his body couldn't fight off the infection. And the infection took over his whole body because he had damage to his nervous system. If you get chronic sinus infections, you have asthma, allergies, or you get chronic, you chronically get sick, there's a good chance you have damage to your nervous system. So um, I wanna bring up a, another patient. She, you know, I wasn't planning on bringing this up. She told me this yesterday, her name's Dixie. Um, and when she, she told me I could share the story. When we met her, um, we did not want Dixie to become a patient. We were hoping that she did not take our recommendations. Uh, I've only had to ask two patients to not continue care here. I've, you know, for, like if you're a threat to my team or you, you give my team too hard a time or you're rude to them really badly, I'm gonna say, hey, this maybe isn't the best place for you. Uh, this was one of those cases where my team went like, should she be here? Like she's, she's, she was not in a good mood, guys, if, if I could tell you. Um, after her first adjustment, she goes, what did you do to me? We go, what do you mean, what did I do to you? Like, should I call my lawyer? Like, what's, she goes, I, I had a dream for the first time in 10 years. Cause she had slept through the night for the first time in 10 years. You need, if you're not having dreams at least once a week, you're not getting into deep REM rest. And she hadn't been in deep sleep for 10 years. And that's why she was in such a crabby mood. That's why she was, it changed her personality. And after adjustment, it relaxed her nervous system. She was able to sleep better and her personality changed. She went from being a person we didn't want to like, we would kind of like, you know, not too happy to see her to she's a joy to be around now. Um, yesterday, uh, no, two days ago, Thursday, um, she has a heart issue. She's getting ready to have a heart valve replacement and she gets her uh, heart refraction tested every year because she has a heart issue. It's gone down every year for 15 years consistently. It has not been, it's been getting worse. Imagine you got a heart issue and they go, oh, it's worse again this year. We need, really need to get you on that surgery list. It's getting worse, it's getting worse. It had gotten all the way down to 33, which is really low. That's bad. This year, for the first time ever, it had gone up to 39. It had jumped uh, six points. And the only thing she had changed was her spinal care and getting adjusted. Now, how in the hell does that happen? What is your spine have to do with your heart, right? That's kind of weird. And this is the last part of the, um, the last blank on your sheet. Chiropractic affects the organs of the body through the autonomic nervous system. That's also called your automatic nervous system, your subconscious nervous system. And what that basically means, like you guys are sitting here, do you have to think about your heartbeat right now? 
Are you having to think about digesting food? Are you thinking about your kidneys filtering your blood? All those things happen beautifully automatically, right? That's how your spinal care affects your health and your body. And that's what happened with Dixie. That's why her heart got better. That's why she slept is we took the pressure off her spinal cord. You guys remember this? She no longer had that pressure and now her brain could talk to her body properly. So we know that health isn't just how you feel. It's not just that you don't have pain. Health is function. How do you function every day? How do you test function? And this is the process of te testing function when it comes to the spine. We look at your range of motion. Can you move? And I'm looking at some of you in the room. I've noticed it gone from like this. It's gotten a lot better over the years, which is amazing, but you should be able to move. Your spine is meant to move. Can you go side to side, 45 degrees, 60, 50 degrees, 80 degrees, 80 degrees. Any decrease in that motion is a sign that there's less function in the spine. Can you move your low back? Can you move your rib cage? When we push, when we push into your spine, is there pain? It should not be painful to have somebody push on your spine. So we're gonna push and feel the joint play. We're gonna do orthopedic and neurological testing. Test your reflex possibly to make sure your nervous system is working. The biggest part is uh, in-depth history. And I feel like this is what we do better than any other chiropractor. Um, I don't know what other chiropractors are asking, but we ask, we want to go deep. We want to know why, what's going on. You'd be amazed at how many people go, doc, no, I'm healthy. I'm here for the crick in my neck, but uh, you know, I'm healthy, I've, uh, but I'm on cholesterol med. I'm on a blood pressure med. I take a medication to sleep. I do have an allergy medication. I take every six months and I take a medication for my stomach, but I'm fine. It's just, I'm here for my crick in my neck, right? So I'm not, I'm not saying that out of a judgment. It's just like, okay, I'm glad you're here for your neck but we can agree there's some functional issues that there's some bigger issues that are going on and we need to talk about that and talk about a strategy or a plan to make that better because i've read that book in our family when you just take meds and i know how that book ends you don't want to be at the end of that book we want to get to the root cause and uh, fix things naturally and then the final thing we're going to test is we're going to take a picture of your spine we're going to look at your x-rays we're going to see do you have the proper curves do you, do you have any arthritis in your spine do you have damage to the nerves and the disc? Um, do you um, have bad posture? Is this going on? Do we need to address that? Guys, typically all that, um, we, if you were to get that tested, if you come in off Google, if you're a patient off Google, that's gonna be somewhere northwards of $200 to get all that testing, to sit down with a doctor. Um, we are now doing something really cool. Next week is called our Valen Spines Patient Appreciation Day. You see what we did there? Pretty clever, right? <laughs> so Valence Minds Day. And this is a cool event. We do it every year. Uh, this is our 12th anniversary, guys. So we opened our clinic 12 years ago, over a decade ago. Some of you, we used to be in a different location, 91st Memorial. Um, we've been open for 12 years. And during this week to honor that, um, you know, that anniversary, anybody that you know that you know is just not healthy, who needs to get checked, it could be a family member, it could be a kid, it could be grandma, uh, it could be your aunt, whoever it is. If they come in, it's only $47 to get all that testing. Now we're gonna take every cent of that $47 fee and we're donating that to the Special Olympics through the Sheriff's Department, okay? This is a very, um, this is a cause I'm passionate about. If you've ever been a part of the Special Olympics or you know anything about it, this is the highlight of these kids' year. It is like their year. They look forward to this all year. And we wanna make sure that it's free for them, that their family doesn't have to pay a cent to uh, participate in this. So we're partnering with the Tulsa Sheriff's Department and their Polar Plunge. And we're gonna be, we wanna try to raise a couple thousand dollars to help them out with this cause.